Great. Welcome to the Lightning Talks on day four. Thanks for being here. My name is Daniel, aka Break the System. I'm your moderator today. Um, Nick says hi. He couldn't be here. Oh. Yeah, just wave everyone. Maybe he'll watch the live stream. So he sent us a few photos, so, you know. All right. Lightning Talks, you have five minutes per speaker. Speakers, please go to the front row. Please sit in the front row here so you can uh, be ready when your talk comes up. You should all have uh, the schedule so you know which talk is the one before you. And if the speaker before you is almost finished, please stand up and go to the left of the podium um, to be ready to, um, to take over. We will hand you this, uh, this so-called clicker, which allows you to continue in your slides. It has a right button and a left button. The right button goes to the next slide. The left button goes to the previous slide. We have this awesome thing here. It's the timekeeper. It will count down. Can we have a presentation? Right. So in the first four minutes of your talk, it will count up. So the, um, the green bar will fill up until the, until the, the top. When you have one minute left, it will begin filling in yellow. And once the yellow has reached the, the top of the bar, you'll have 30 minutes, which are displayed in red. 30 seconds. <laughs> right, I, we, we need all of your help to remind our speakers that they have to finish on time. So five seconds before the end of the talk, we will give you the signal and you will have to count on with us together. You just train that with him. And remember, Nick is always watching, so make him proud. Right, um, some other rules. Um, after you talk, please don't take the clicker with you. Please give the clicker to the next speaker, they will need it. Uh, talk into the mic. So um, do not turn around and look at your slides. Your slides, you can see your slides on this screen in front of you. So you don't have to turn around and your mouth has to be near the mi microphone because otherwise you won't hear me. <laughs> right, there's also translations available. Uh, call DECT 8014 to uh, listen to the, to the translated slides. I think most of our slides today are in uh, English, so um, the translation team should be translating them into German. All right, um, have a great session. Thank you very much. Um, one more thing, if you're sitting on the, on, at the, at the, right next to the walls, um, because there are um, outlets and everything, please don't uh, sit there because you're blocking the exits and that's a fire hazard. Actually, actually, it could be okay. It could barely be okay if you sit in the first part of the hall. But please uh, leave the second part of the hall clear and tell other people to leave them clear. Otherwise, we have to walk around and ask people to move. And you know how it is. You don't like that, and we don't like that. And thank you very much. All right, and with that, I welcome our first speaker, Rob Cronenberg. Uh, right. I'm not gonna have a Rob, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, go. Thank you. I'm not going to have a technical presentation, but yesterday I learned something about Shamir secret sharing, and I have five um, sort of arguments. I believe every argument is a dot on the line, and when it hits the I intercept, something will change. Now, the first um, n changing nature that we see is the nature of success. Um, there's a mass psychologist, Stinchcomb, he says, a person you can see as one, 0.6 generic influences, gender, schooling, work, uh, 0.4 idiosyncrasy, you as you. Now scale that to a million, and you see that the 0.6 is something that you can steer on, which the systems have always done, and individuals always become uh, either lone descent or something that can be managed as they go down to 004. So this is why you always urged to grow, to grow and to scale is synonymous to being successful. Now, as you grow, the tools 
are laying in waiting for you and basically to rule you after that. Now the net has changed this ratio and I think also in the fact that we're also talking about a lot of individuals here, um, it's more becoming 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which means that the nature of power, power itself is changing. Now the second nature that's changing is the nature of the digital. Uh, the driver today is Internet of Things. Um, you can call it pervasive computing, Ubicomp, ambient intelligence is 50 years old. It's happening very fast. It's happening very fast because it's 50 years old. It's nothing new. We have a triangle, and the triangle is a strong human and system pool for more data and information. The need of logistics to individuate every item on the planet, really a radio frequency, near-field communication, QR codes, barcodes, um, the ONS object name service scheme by GS1.org, which basically attempts to want to individuate all items in one huge database, is federated now, but it's still the same. Uh, the third driver is IP46, which means that we'll, we'll be seeing um, software in basically anything, and IP in anything that holds a little bit of software. So the, the talks I heard yesterday were a lot about privacy preserving situations on sort of standalone devices. But this is completely irrelevant in this context. The, the whole leaking is the feature, it's not a, it's not a bug, it's a feature. So you cannot fight it unless you take over the entire system. Um, unless, of course, you want to go and walk in aluminium foil. Now, the nature of power itself is changing. So what is the Internet of Things? It's basically lining up the networks, body area network, wearables, um, local area network, smart meters, wide area network, connected cars, very wide area network, smart city. That's the line. You want to occupy the gateways between that line. And look at what Google is doing. They have two ways into every network. They have the lens and the glasses for the body. You go home, you sync that data into the power meter. Didn't work, so they bought Nest. Then they have a car. So you go home, and all the, the data from your health and all the data from your home is syncing into your car because they have a car and they're selling their knowledge throughout the automotive line. So there will not be a car that you can buy that does not have Google in it. Then, of course, we have the smart city where Google Org is sponsoring anything that has to do with open data. So you might as well dream about it and you get a mail in the morning. We will sponsor. Now, it's crucial that these gateways are in public hands, not commercial hands. Um, otherwise, we will see smart cities for 10,000 people and Mad Max in between. It's basically already happening. So the fight is not about privacy, it's about solidarity. And open data is not enough, because the over-the-top players like Uber, Helpling, Airbnb are simply parasiting on that, not paying anything back to the real infrastructures down below it. So also the, the platform on which all this data gets to add value needs to be in public hands. Now, I'm not talking about the public hands that we see today. I'm talking about organized networks or platformism, hands. And the fourth changing nature is the nature of business. Um, business models, anybody who's working uh, in this field at the moment realizes that every use case brings a new business model. Uh, Boeing has 200 items in the last plane that has a separating monitoring mechanism, and this means that if I am delivering that service to Boeing, they can no longer hide any cost or overhead in any of this. It means that they always have to be in a real-time flow. Everybody's getting worried because it's about radical transparency, so it's doable. We have a new dawn because we will be the new open third-party trust provider. Thank you. Perfect timing. Next one is Peter with Backpacking the World. Yeah. <laughs> the speaker will see if you have 30 seconds left because it will turn from yellow to red on right in front of him. Hey, I'm Peter, and I'm going to talk about how to backpack the world. Um, so between, in 2013 and 2014, I traveled to 10 countries for one year all around the world. I uh, literally went one time around the globe. And I think it's one of the coolest things I've ever done, and I want to encourage more people to do such a thing. So this is a bit like frequently asked questions about world traveling. 
Um, why you should do it? Because there's so, so many beautiful places around the world you should see. You can meet so many cool people around the world, other travelers and locals that are so smart, have so many different opinions than you have, and you can learn so much from them and it will change your view of the world. Uh, you can learn a lot about the privilege you enjoy every day, and you can also learn how it feels to be different than anyone else around you, and that also can get you a good feeling about how it probably feels like if someone from somewhere else comes to your country and how they feel. Um, you learn how to live simple, because um, you don't have many things you can take with you. You learn how to deal with that. And you can learn a lot about how yourself, who you are. Um, like in everyday life, the people around you basically make you, and when you're somewhere else, you can watch yourself much easily. And yeah, you can learn much, much more. Um, how to go. Um, so when I say travel, I mean backpacking. So it's really light. So take a big backpack with you around 60 liter, um, take a small day pack with you. Um, I had about one week of light clothing, camera, notebook, a hard disk for your pictures. Have a second credit card in case your first one gets lost or stolen. Happened to me. Um, have very essential medicine with you, like for headache, stomach problems, because it's going to happen. You can buy medicine everywhere, but like it's good to have the very essentials with you. Have passport copies and passport pictures. If you lose your passport, um, it gets much easier to get a new one if you have a copy. And also for visas, you need passport pictures. And um, it's just better if you have them with you. Plan enough. Not too much, not too less. If you don't plan anything, you're going to end up in really shitty hostels and you're going to have really expensive flights. Um, so plan enough, but don't plan too much because you might be wrong in your planning. Are you definitely going to be wrong at your planning? So the right amount. Um, you can travel alone or with a friend or partner. Um, alone is much, much easier, but you also need more courage. Um, but if you travel with a friend or partner, watch out for conflict. Um, yeah. So have an open mind. Do things you wouldn't do at home because you want to learn new things. If you do the same things you do at home in another country, you won't learn anything. There's a McDonald's everywhere around the world. If you only go to McDonald's, you're not going to learn anything. Um, check out WeltriseInfo.de. It's an amazing website that gives you all details about how to do it. Um, transport from expensive to cheap. Yeah, planes, find good connect. At airports like Bangkok, for example, is a really good connected airport in Asia. Don't use small local airports. If you use a train to a night train, um, car gives you a lot of freedom. You can do whatever you want at whatever time. Um, but it's usually expensive, but you can share with other people. And bus is the ultimate travel thing. Um, you can get it like in the even remotest and less developed countries. But it's really, really uncomfortable. Um, but it's usually what you end up with. Money. Well, if you're an IT guy, you can usually work while you travel. Um, or you can also do some local work. So like you can do farming, for example, in Australia. The cost of living is very different depending on where you go. So for example, one day in India will cost you about five euro. One day in Australia might cost you about 50 euro. And by doing the same thing, eating the same things, everything is the same. Reduce your luxury. Take a bus over a plane or train. Choose a hostel over a hotel. Cook for yourself. Don't go to restaurants. Where you go. So some countries are harder to travel than others. So you might want to start with an easy one, but I really recommend you to go to harder ones because it's where you learn the most. It's where you go to the coolest things. So you might not want to start with Bangladesh, but at some point you should for sure go to Bangladesh. Um, when to go? Well, keep in mind when it's summer in the northern hemisphere, it's winter in the southern hemisphere and the other way around. Some countries have a rainy season, and it's not very nice to travel during the rainy season. There's a really, really good website about this, eclima.de. It's in German and English. Um, if you have any questions, you can get me on Twitter and check out these websites. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Time Well Spent by Joe Edelman. Hi, everybody. I'll just wait until my slide's up. Good? Oh, is it, where's, where's my slide? OK, great. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a billion lousy mornings. And I'm going to talk about a principle, a technology principle that we can use to salvage these mornings to um, repair them. Um, so most of us have an ideal thing that we like to do first thing when we wake up in the morning. For some of us, it's um, uh, having sex. For some of us, it's doing yoga or taking 
a nice walk outside, thinking big about our day. But most of us aren't spending our morning doing that. Um, actually, we're spending our morning consuming mass media, following links, uh, watching cat videos, things like that. And uh, when I say most of us, I mean like 80 or 90% of smartphone owners are spending 30 minutes uh, as the very first thing that they do on their morning. And I think uh, if this isn't their ideal morning, then we have to think about how to redesign technology so that it helps us live uh, you know, our ideal morning the way we actually want to live our morning. So I think this is similar to something that we had to learn in the 1990s. Um, in the 90s, we had to learn that screens need to make sense, and they need to make sense to new users or people get confused. And now I think we need to learn that screens need to reflect what's important to us. Sorry, the slides are cut off. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that, specifically with regard to these mornings. And I'll explain in terms of the lock screen, which is a screen that has an implication for our mornings. Um, so this is a lock screen. And what I mean when I say that the lock screen needs to reflect what's important to us, and one thing I mean is that it needs to uh, reflect the activities that are important to us in the morning. Lock screens make certain activities easy. They make it easy to see everything you've missed. They make it easy to jump quickly to your apps. They make it easy to see discussions that have been going on without you, and they make it easy to be alerted to new content. But these aren't necessarily the things that are important to us in the mornings. If you want to do yoga, then an activity that's important to you is getting out of bed uh, and knowing that you have time for uh, yoga or thinking deeply about your day or whatever you need, to, you need to do. So you can imagine a lock screen that actually does this. Oh, this is too bad. Oh, no, it is legible up there. Good. Um, <laughs> so we put a, a, a bell uh, on the lock screen that you can ring when you're ready to get out of bed, and we put a little note that says um, that you have time you know, before your first appointment or whatever. Um, another thing that I mean when I say the screen needs to reflect what's important to us is that uh, there's certain relationships that lock screens put us in, and those relationships might not be the relationships that are important to us in the morning. So. Uh, here, for instance, there's notifications that have put us in relationships that are about endorsement, like people are liking our content or are friending us, they're endorsing us. It's like writing, writing uh, letters of recommendation for each other or something like that. It's not necessarily the kind of relationship that you want to be in first thing in the morning. Um, and uh, if you want to do yoga, then maybe what you need is a companion. If that's the kind of relationship that's important to you in the morning, we can design a lock screen for that. Here, I've made a new kind of notification a notification that just alerts you about companions. Um, Anne will do yoga with you over Skype, Jim will journal with you, maybe in Google Docs, that kind of thing. The third thing, and the last thing that I'll, I'll mention about how screens can reflect what's important to us, is that there's certain thinking styles that are implied by the navigation and layout of our screens. Um, this kind of thinking style, all these notifications, implies that there's a lot going on. You, you feel very busy, maybe you feel important. But if the kind of thinking style that's important to you in the morning is thinking deeply about your day, then uh, we kind of want a different kind of widget. So this is a widget that encourages you uh, to think, like, uh, to dream big about your day. You can click whether you want an adventure, whether you want a quiet day, whether you want uh, deeply con deep connection with your friends. And, uh, and it will recommend apps or point to notifications or, or people you could reach out to or something based on the kind of day that you actually want to have, not based on what all the apps are interested in having you do. Um, so that's what I mean when I say the screen needs to reflect what's important to us. I think this suggests not just new lock screens, but new news feeds, new home screens, uh, actually like a new relationship between the apps, the device, and the human using it. And more than that, even uh, new algorithms, uh, a whole new way of thinking about technology, thinking of technology in, in service to what we really want to do with our lives, um, not in service to the developers of apps and media companies. If you're interested in helping me, uh, great, figure out how to build all of this new kind of technology, or if you know designers, big thinkers, that are ready to rethink uh, OSs from the ground up, please get in touch. My Twitter handle's cut off here. But I think we could give a billion people their ideal morning, and the Twitter handle is Edelwax, E-D-E-L-W-A-X, E-D-E-L-W-A-X. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next talk is called Letters on Mars. Hello, my name is Leela. And for the last year especially, but also before, I've been excitedly following all the news that have been happening in space, basically. 
Um, and I couldn't believe when I found out my university has a space flight society that actually regularly does interesting projects, one of which is lettuce on Mars, trying to send lettuce seed to Mars and growing lettuce on Mars. I wondered for a while whether I really, really wanted to stand on this stage and talk about it because it comes with a bigger context. Uh, the project is part of the Mars One University competition. Mars One is a non-profit company that wants to send humans on a non-return trip to Mars, which is a kind of interesting project um, with moral questions involved. Uh, however, the project itself is asking universities to propose payloads that can really go on a Mars lander in 2018 that is not manned. One payload, one payload can go on this lander, and it inspired university teams, it inspired students to think about these complex problems and think about them like they're actually their problems to solve. Now, the final 10 teams uh, passed the te technical, technical feasibility test, and they reached high popularity. Um, and now, this month until the 31st, they're competing to see who, which project will actually get to Mars in 2018. So, yeah, since it, it's really a great thing just to watch students and teams trying to explain what their project is about, how they're solving the complex challenges of space, I decided I sh should still tell people about this. So, the project from my university specifically wants to send lettuce seeds um, to Mars, and once we're landed, um, it will heat because Mars is actually pretty cold, um, and it will provide a an atmosphere and a system where lettuce would like to grow. Um, <clears throat> what makes this one special is that it wants to use uh, the environment, so it wants to use CO2 from Mars and it wants to use the sunlight. So we could get lettuce which has atoms from Mars incorporated in the lettuce. It wants to use lettuce which is a plant that everybody knows and it's actually already an edible plant um, and we could watch it grow on Mars. And then there's things that I didn't know needed to be considered before I got involved in this. For example, if we send something to another planet, we have to consider something called cost power regulations, which means for future missions, we shouldn't leave anything that might be alive there. So in the end, we have to make sure to really, really kill everything that we brought to Mars. Um, yeah. So the project where you can find more information, FAQs that were written by students based on questions they got is Letters on Mars. And today and tomorrow there's still a chance for you to vote as well. And you can find information on that as well. And I would like you all to consider it and at least check out all the projects that were proposed. Thank you. Thank you. We have nearly one and a half minute left, so if there are any questions, uh, there was one question from the internet, why not bacon? <laughs> well, bacon can come after lettuce, but bacon has to eat, and if we just send bacon, it wouldn't be a complex life one we could watch. Are there some other questions? Oh, there's also a Reddit AMA from yesterday which is probably linked on the website and on the social media accounts that they have. <laughs> the question was, are you going to send dressing as well? Well, let's go lettuce, bacon, cows, dressing, because I really like yogurt dressing, so... Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next one is Cute Browser. Hi, I'm writing a browser. At this point, people think I'm crazy. Well, they're not entirely wrong, but actually I have a reason I do so. So, there are three pretty common browsers right now. Well, let's say two. <laughs> Now, I really was hoping browsers over the past few years probably and never was really happy. Because I want whim-like key bindings in a browser and I also want to click links with the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Now there are some projects or add-ons for Firefox like Pentadactyl and Vimperator, and there are some add-ons for Chromium like um, Vimium it was. Um, for Chrome or Chromium, the add-ons didn't really feel right for me, mainly because the add-on API doesn't really allow you to do much. So there were some key bindings, but that's all. So I wasn't really happy with it. For Firefox, well, it used, at least at the point I used it, it just got more um, slow and big and buggy. So yeah, also it wasn't really a solution. Then there are all these small browsers like um, DWB, LuaKit, Surf, Usable, uh, Wimp, Wimprobable, and so on. For those, they're all based on the same library, WebKit uh, JDK, and on an older version of it, which is deprecated. And at least the one I was using, uh, DWB, it, uh, it's that, it's not maintained anymore, and it won't get ported. So yeah, I started my own thing. So I got the tools I like to work with, that is Python, Qt, and WebKit at the moment. And now, um, a bit more than a year later, I think I started it start of December last year, there's actually a browser you can use. There's a command line with more or less awesome auto-completion. Well, not complete, uh, so it doesn't do history at the moment, but it works very well. I can click my links with the keyboard like I like to. And it works on pretty much any system. It works very well on um, distributions which package a recent version of Qt, that is Arch Linux, Gen2, Mac OS X, and Windows. And it works more or less on distributions with older versions like Debian and Ubuntu, which hopefully will change, at least in Debian Unstable, very soon. Then it will work well there as well. Some things I learned. It's a good idea to focus on clean code and to mark bugs as easy because you will get contributors. <laughs> <laughs> and when you still try to keep the user base low, it's not a good idea to mention it on Reddit. <laughs> so the project is called Cute Browser. You can find the channel on Freenode or contact me at me at the or on the uh, at the Swiss Chaos Assembly. Thank you. We have also one minute left, so if there is any question. Which JavaScript engine are you using? Which JavaScript engine are you using? Um, it's using Qt WebKit at the moment, which is using Web, uh, was it JavaScript Core at the moment, I think. Um, there are plans to switch to Q Web Engine, which is using Blink and Chromium as a backhand. But the API is still a bit incomplete, so this will take another half a year or so. Sorry? An API for extensions, not yet. There will be for Python extensions, maybe for JavaScript extensions. Okay. More questions, just, yeah. No, you sorry, no more see. questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can see how you can reach me for more questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, OpenAge. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is JJ. And my name is Mick E. Uh, we are developing a free software re-implementation of the Age of Empires 2 game engine license GPL. <laughs> so, uh, while the original game works fine under every second version of Wine or so, uh, the networking has been broken forever on every platform, and it's also not that great for extensibility and modding. 
So we decided it's best to just do it ourselves instead of trying to fix it. Yeah, the modding community of the stock game is pretty awesome and they did a really good job. But it is still somehow limited, even though projects like the user patch do some binary hacking in the original game executable. <laughs> so our goal is to do a stable clone with all the game features and without the bugs and introduce some actual modding and extensibility features. Ideas like infinite maps or more, more than eight player matches, like weather or even something like a zombie survival mode will be possible. So uh, we are doing the whole thing in Scratch uh, in C++ and Python 3. Uh, we are using uh, tech like SDL, OpenGL, Opus, FreeType, uh, all the new shit. <laughs> Uh, we are working heavily, or we are building heavily on the work of modders. Uh, they all have done a great job reversing all the file formats and everything. So they really should have some of the credit for the thing. Uh, we are no artists, so we are just reusing the original game assets. We also want the thing to look just like the stock game. But uh, of course, uh, if there are any artists here, maybe you're of course welcome to do uh, free assets. But, uh, so uh, regularly you need to own an actual copy of Age of Empires 2 to be able to play Open Age. Yeah, um, so what, what does work at the moment? So we got working terrain rendering, you can see it. You can, we can also have uh, walking units with pathfinding, we have sound, uh, and we have an infinite map, so it's like Minecraft just with chunks. Um, we got a fully featured uh, terminal emulator which can run Vim, so you can uh, write your, your AI scripts in-game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as the previous project al also mentioned, it's uh, hard to uh, stay unrecognized on Reddit and Hacker News, so uh, yeah, just one day we went viral before we expected it. Actually, we uh, wanted, yeah, to uh, for you today to come out with it and spread the word. But uh, somebody else did it before you. And we got over 200 hits in just three days, uh, 200,000, sorry, 200,000 hits in just one day. And uh, <laughs> some awesome guys uh, immediately did a Mac port. The Windows port is still uh, coming, maybe. <laughs> And also implemented all the walking unit and uh, animation stuff. This is all done by the community. And loads of build system fixes. Uh, we were the top five company directly listed below Google and Facebook, which was pretty funny to watch. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'd really like to encourage you to contribute and spread the word. Uh, tell people who like this game, because yeah, I think we can bring it to a next level again. <laughs> Every one of you knows maybe the rewrite on Steam, the high definition edition, which is actually yeah, just a widescreen patch and Steam networking. But this really brings endless capabilities. Yeah, so you can, uh, the, uh, the slide is yeah, cut off, so the actual URL is open age. Just visit it or join our RC channel, and if you have questions, uh, ask us. If you hate the code, flame us, it's okay. <laughs> All right, we're on time, so we're allowing one or two questions. Uh, can you zoom out? Can you zoom out? Uh, it's no problem doing that with OpenGL, but it's not implemented at the moment. So, yeah, submit a patch. Any other questions? Sorry? Uh, from this uh, internet thingy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> the question was, where do we get the assets from? You do, of course, buy the game on Amazon. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Install it via Vine, uh, and then you can run the converter. Yeah. 
Uh, at the moment, is the, there's no actual gameplay features. This is just pathfinding with walking and animated units, building placement, uh, and terrain rendering. So it's just one year in development from scratch. So, and we're lazy, of course. Right, one more thing. The guys actually brought a demo, but we couldn't uh, make it work on this machine. So uh, lots of kudos <laughs> to these guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up is Nitro Key. Go. Hi, I, I'm George. I will present uh, Nitro Key. Uh, from those that they know CryptoStick uh, project, it's the same one. Um, it's a USB device uh, used for security. What are the security challenges? Uh, basically, the main question uh, that uh, the project was started with was uh, if we can encrypt uh, emails or communication in, trust, in untrusted uh, hosts. Um, okay, yeah. Um, and then also, uh, and then also, <laughs> um, how to hide our uh, secret keys from uh, malware in general? Um, there was a trade-off uh, of how mobile can we be, and uh, what are the consequences if you lose the device? And ah, uh, uh, well, passwords don't work in general. The static password, so you have to be better than that. Um, that's all on the slide. Sorry, it's my first talk, so. <laughs> uh, the device, what are the features that we uh, provide to mitigate these uh, challenges are, um, uh, we securely, um, um, we safely store the secret keys in a, uh, in a smart card, um, open PGP smart card, and um, then we provide the on-time passwords uh, which are compatible with uh, the common RFCs, and uh, uh, you can use it instead of a Google Authenticator. Um, if you really want to use static passwords, you can use it uh, with a with a safe uh, with a safe password manager. Um, yeah, and also there is an uh, encrypted uh, mass storage um, around uh, I think 64 gigas. Uh, which is hardware encryption and supports also hidden volumes. Uh, the whole project, software and hardware, it's open source, um, so you feel free to uh, check it out and help. Um, yeah, the architecture is uh, uh, very simple. Uh, we trust the OpenPGP smart card for uh, um, all our encryption procedures and uh, the features all the features around it, they, they just use the OpenPGP smart card, the, the encryption mechanism inside the smart card. Uh, the OpenPGP version 2.1 is a new version, not uh, released yet, so we're just working and developing on that. Uh, the firmware is written in C. Uh, uh, the device, you can use it without uh, drivers, you only need the application shipped with uh, the device. And it's uh, compatible with uh, the most usual OS. Um, so yeah, general use cases are you can encrypt your emails. It, we are uh, um, uh, we use GNU PG. Um, you can use it with Thunderbird. You can authenticate to SSH. Um, you can use it pretty much everywhere that uh, OTP one-time passwords are supported. Um, most of the major websites they support and more and more are going to support one-time passwords. There's also a link for, uh, to a website that uh, has a complete list of uh, websites that support two-factor authentication and which one exactly. Uh, you can use uh, the encrypted mass storage and with the hidden volumes you have plausible deniability so you can uh, Nobody can really prove if there is something existing on uh, on your hard drive, on your uh, storage, or not. Um, and yeah, the password manager. Um, you can sus subscribe to our uh, webpage, nitrokey.com, GitHub for development or uh, issues. Um, also, maybe you can uh, audit the code. We will like to. Um, 
the, um, uh, there is the website for the uh, one for the one-time password sites and my email. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Next up, we have Neural Hacks by Fox. Hi, I'm Fox. I'm a neuroscience student, and I work on nonlinear analysis with EEG signal. As a hacker, I'm passionate about the potential relationship that could emerge between neuroscience and hackers. On the cutting edge of the state of the art of neuroscience, we've got things that link the brain to the body when the spinal cord's been severed, like NeuroBridge. We've also got brain-to-brain -brain communication directly over the internet, sending simple thoughts and even motor control, where you can move someone else's hand. Isn't that scary? <laughs> and we can fly aircraft using our thoughts. This has been proven, but a lot of people aren't ready to actually sit in this plane. <laughs> there are a lot of proprietary systems out there. I know a lot of you are probably familiar with them. Many people hack these in order to get at what's inside, get at the data. But without hacking them, many of these proprietary algorithms are not accessible, which is why hackers need to step in and fill the gap. Many times, researchers are going on grant funding, they have very specialized fields, and there's a lot of red tape to cut through to get published, to get the information out there of what they've discovered. Hackers are in a unique position, without funding, to come up with more economic and creative solutions, without all the bureaucracy, they can have faster and open innovation, and without the over-specialization, they're free to integrate all these other fields and specializations to come up with broader reaching applications. They can generate public interest this way, which leads to more funding and further research and further quality research, and encourages interdisciplinary working together that most neuroscientists aren't currently considering. The thing is that unlike rocketry and robotics and a lot of stuff like that, Neuroscience is all cutting edge. If you hack neuroscience, you are hacking at the cutting edge. There is so much that is not known, no matter what the doctors tell you. So you can actually contribute to open science. You can make a difference. It's not just like building a rocket in your backyard that everyone's done before. It's really exciting. <laughs> you can have this... <laughs> You can use this for scientific analysis. You can actually visualize interesting graphics and have artistic representation of your brainwaves. You can integrate it into your favorite game interfaces and have uses for it in gamification. Through these methods, you can discover more about your own brain. You could enhance the way your brain works through neural feedback, through all sorts of other things that help improve uh, meditation, that can predict epileptic fits, that can help people with stroke to bypass those pathways. There's so many possibilities. In games, you could become more immersed in virtual reality, and we use computers now to interact with the world around us by enhancing the way we use computers, making it more seamless, more intuitive. We are enhancing the way we interact with the world and with others. So science, art, and games, those are pretty good reasons, but I know a lot of you really just want to control robots with your mind, like some amazing tech Jedi, because I know I do. All this is possible, and more. Our brains may be locked away in dark spaces, but they are not unknowable black boxes, because it's a frontier, it's an open frontier, and we're all explorers. And if you want to explore with me, I suggest that we get together, form a community, and have open discussion, open learning, and move towards a more integrated future. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? 
If there are uh, no questions from the audience, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. How do you want to form a community and where do you want to start? There are a lot of people already out there starting on this, uh, you know, hacking frontier with neuroscience. There are also neuroscientists who are moving towards open technology and publishing their finding in open source journals, publishing their tech so that ordinary people can use it. And there needs to be some more participation to link these together, and I'd like to help do that, to get people in touch with each other, to have a forum for sharing this information openly between the scientists, between the hackers, so that we can all collaborate. Thank you very much. So next up is Waysum. Okay, so um, I'm Nakus. I'm one of the developers of Waysome, which is a window manager based on the Wayland protocol. And uh, first I'm going to talk about why are we doing this, because um, first of all, there's X right now, the X server, right? Everybody's using that. And it's pretty old, it's from the 80s, and um, some day, uh, at some time uh, in the past years, there is this new protocol being developed, and, and the past months we were working on this Window Manager, because we thought that Wayland is pretty usable right now, at least the protocol. And so we thought, okay, what did we learn from X? What did we learn from the Window Managers in X? And uh, we thought that, for example, E3, pretty awesome, awesome, is awesome. And um, for example, I'm a pretty heavy user of Herbstluft VM, and that's pretty awesome too. So we thought, well, at least we don't want to like break the user experience, and uh, why not like use the way people are using those? Um, window managers and make our own, but based on Wayland. And um, so I say Wayland is awesome, and we wanted to keep the code base small because you don't need very expensive stuff to make, for example, a tiling window manager. There's no need for a lot of uh, stuff around it. So um, what do we want from for this window manager? We want tiling because tiling is awesome, and we want to choose how we do tiling. We don't we don't want to like just have to be forced to have three windows on one screen and they're all one next to each other. We want to be able to choose there to split the screen in two in the middle and say choose window on the left, one big window on the right, and that's how I program. And um, everybody is different, so it definitely has to be user-defined. It also has to be scriptable. For example, if I open my, if I boot for the first time, I want, for example, that my first workspace has this arrangement of a window left and a window on the right, but on my second workspace, I want free, free uh, kind of uh, ways to have a window open for my IRC chats, for example. And yeah, that's pretty much the idea of Waysom is do what you want. It's your computer. It's how you work. It's, well, it's, it's how you, yeah, it's how we work. And um, the way we do it is, in, at first we started, as we, we're still starting, a uh, semester project uh, for the Futwang University. And um, it's open source, so actually everybody can just come and help us check it out, tell us it's awesome, tell us it sucks, so everything is okay. And uh, we're five students, which of which uh, Free are here if you want, want to talk to us. Uh, we've, we're working on this since October. We will have to give it in in January, but we're not going to stop developing it at that point. At point. And um, yeah, so it's written in C, so we want it to be elegant because well, C is awesome. And and um, yeah. <laughs> and we can do pretty awesome stuff with C. And of course, we're using this awesome site GitHub for uh, collaboration. In terms of functionality, as I said, you have these windows, you have these sets. We call them sets because that's mathematically much more what's going on behind the scenes. Because uh, you have these containers, and you can move containers around. In the end, a window is a container, so you have containers in containers. Um, the API is pretty simple on a, a lower level. And it works over JSON through a Unix pipe at this point, where you can just pipe stuff into it, and the compositor reads it, parses it, and do stuff. 
there's, there's stuff with it. And through this JSON API, you can then make your shortcuts, reassign your shortcuts, and yeah, I think that's pretty awesome. Um, there's also a config, obviously, so that's pretty standard stuff. Right now, we have uh, the key combos working, we have the JSON API working. We're also able to use the Western terminal, so we can actually hack at WASOM inside WASOM, so that's, that's I think, a pretty big part. And um, yeah, the other example clients from the Western project are working as well. There's still some which are not working, for example, the subsurfaces, which we haven't implemented yet, but that's coming. And um, there's still a few setbacks. For example, we're still using Linux-specific stuff. So yeah, we have to boot that out. And if you want to talk to us, look at it. Everything links up there. We also have Reddit subreddit, which is uh, Waysome. And well, on GitHub, Waysome. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up is Dr. Hamster, which is pro with his project called Bitwork. Yeah, hi, it's Jonas, actually. <laughs> uh, before I talk about my project Bitwork, I would like to ask you, who has used uh, Blender 3D? Just raise your hand. Oh yeah, that's a lot of people. <laughs> okay, for those of you who don't know Blender, it's that awesome 3D rendering package. Uh, it's GPL, it has been used for a lot of movies, it has been used for uh, CGI production, it's cool, you should check it out. Those of you who have used Blender will know this problem. Rendering takes forever. It uses enormous amounts of computing power. But what if, if we had this computing power at our fingertips, massive computing power at our fingertips, and as a peer-to-peer -peer service? I know what you're thinking. There's the cloud. Isn't that the cloud? Like Amazon EC2. But actually, that kind of service is too low level to be easy to use for that specific task, configuring lots of computers and stuff. There's volunteer computing, like Boeing, SETI at home. But actually, you can't get your problem solved with it unless you're a scientist. There's commercial render farms. They do that kind of stuff. But they are expensive, and they're often subscription-based. So here comes Bitwork into play. I call it a Bitcoin-friendly, anonymous marketplace for computing power. Once installed, it's easy to use. There's no need to manage any servers. And it solves your problem, because you can offer payment. You can pay with Bitcoin. And it's also cheap, because you only pay for what you use. There's one thing that makes Bitwork special. Clients can switch sites. They cannot only buy computing power, they can also sell their own computing power to the service, to others, for Bitcoin. This is Blender in action, using the Bitwork plugin to perform rendering. As you can see, the scene has been divided into a couple of tiles, and they are dispatched simultaneously to the Bitwork service. This is where the speedup comes from. This is Bitwork's own user interface, and it shows what Bitwork is doing, and also how much uh, Bitcoin you have left in your account. This is Bitwork's homepage. So what's next? There's going to be a 0.5 release soon, and there's also going to be a beta test. Uh, I'm going to use real transactions, real Bitcoin transactions, and you will be able to transfer money into the system and out of the system. There are also some issues yet to resolve. One issue is uh, reliability. How do you make sure that the answers you dispatch uh, the, the answers you get from, from other participants, that they are correct. The other issue is privacy. At the moment, you dispatch your work to multiple clients and you have no control over who gets the work. So you can't use Bitwork at the moment for privacy-sensitive uh, projects. Uh, 
but it might be still cool. Bitwork is free software. Both the client and the server are released under the GPL. Please check it out. All right, so we might have time for one or two questions. Please raise your hands and a microphone will magically appear near you. Um, so your program works for Blender. There are many other programs as well that have um, considerably high um, computing peaks. Are there any intentions to, um, yeah, to, to, to make it usable for other programs as well? Thanks for the question. That was what I forgot to mention. <laughs> uh, yes, there's much opportunity to grow into that direction. There's lots of other rendering engines, and there's also lots of other software that could profit from peer-to-peer -peer computing, such as scientific computing, cryptography, lots of stuff. And that's something that I, can, that I hope you guys can help me with. Uh, making it a real community project. Thank you. All right, one more question. Uh, the person in the purple sheet shirt. Well, I have a question from IRC, which is uh, Bitcoin mining included, but, well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, Bitcoin's included. But you can make Bitcoin. You can, you can uh, have your computer work. So you get some Bitcoin if you put your computer to work. All right. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Our last talk before the break is IRSSI. Are you ready? Oh, hang on. You had, some, you had some more slides. So here we go. OK, hello. Um, maybe we can start with Sari. Who is still using ERC? And who is using text mode clients for that? And who is using ERC? Uh, a few are left. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thank you. And um, it's been quite popular, but of course there is a lot of competition and also, I'm not sure if ERC is the solution for everything or if it should be. But there was actually, um, yeah, here's some of the competition. Maybe you're using one of these and there are very interesting concepts in there, very nice clients also. Yeah, there was a release recently and what changed? Yeah, actually, they have true colors now. <laughs> I believe this is the first uh, text mode client for IRC with true colors. But uh, yeah, they were late on 265 colors. So, and also um, there is of course the Dane um, security. T check uh, currently only implemented in ERC as far as I know. And I also want to mention that uh, while it's mainly used as IRC client, there's also the working uh, Silk uh, client all based on ERC and uh, ICB and yeah, ERC XMPP is also working but uh, not very good, well maintained and not few featureful. And I think it's a pretty uh, interesting, um, it might be a pretty interesting project still because there's lots of different ways to work with or contribute to. Yeah, what's old, um, like the X11 client is still working, <laughs> but it's still, it's pretty buggy. And uh, JavaScript uh, plugin is still not finished, but it's also working. And recently, a lot of people like to use web browsers. So yeah, it's got that covered now too. Here's an example and you can play it. I posted the link on 
the IRC channel yesterday too. And here's another example of what's possible with web browsers, but this is all all not finished. But so if you're interested, you can use JavaScript. You can use um, you can use Perl. <laughs> And yeah, there's also mobile. Um, one is the HTML on mobile, and the other is like a native client, but also in a very early stage still. So if you're interested in uh, Android, <laughs> Java, and that crap, then you can also get involved. Um, and of course, there are still a lot of issues. For example, it feels there's currently no one like into the C level. Uh, it's uh, C is written in C with glib, and uh, networking code could really use some improvements. Like it's still not very nice and straightforward to get with Tor and SSL onto Freenode. That that should just be fixed. And there are some ideas um, that I have written down here, which are like, yeah, also inspired from the other clients. And it's, of course, a question where does ERC want to go or should it go anywhere? Because a lot of long time old users, they say, hey, nothing is wrong with it. It's working just fine. Why would you want to change anything? And there are all already some uh, new features possible with the text front and in the latest release, uh, as par aside from the colors. And I think uh, what's quite nice feature is to recolor people's nicks when they have left the chat. So if you ignore the joins and quits, then you can still see if someone's left because it's changed in real time in your history on the screen. Okay? Yeah, there are. Python bindings, they work, missing maintenance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have a 15 minute break now until 2 p.m. Afterwards, we'll start with a poem and some hacking. Thank you.
Dear video angels, could you please uh, put uh, the laptop on the screen so that people know that we are having lightning talks? All right, let's try the countdown again. When I raise my fist, you have five seconds left and you count with me. Thank you. Welcome back to round two of the Lightning Talks on day four. All right, first up, we have a poem. Hey, the poem will be in German, but I don't know, maybe the uh, translation team is able to make it rhyme in real time. It's called <laughs> Philosophieren übers Optimieren, also known as uh, über die Polymorphie der Philosophie. Ich stehe auf mehrfach vererben, noch mehr als auf Lochkarten vererben und warte daher auf Chavas Adensterben. Ich will lieber mehrfach Wissen erwerben. Ich will lieber noch mehrfach sterben, als unter Chavas Dach zu verderben und immer neue Kunden mit Krach für den Schwachsinn anzuwerben. Nur kurz nachgefragt, würdest du lieber über Lava philosophieren oder in Java programmieren? Ich hätte bei Lava nachgehakt, denn Java sackt. Denn ich bin Optimierer und dabei Optimist, habe ich in TI einen Vierer, dann denke ich nicht, oh Mist, ich bin kein Turing-Codierer. Genauso wenig wie es Onat ist, ich bin ein Ring-Null-Programmierer. Und währenddessen ein Onanist. Ich bin, ich bin ein Mikrooptimierer und einer, der groß ohm ist. Ich bin mein eigener Kompilierer und meines Programms Komponist. Ich bin ein Zyklenaddierer und ein regester Faschist. Ich brauche keine Exception und auch Branching soll sie verpissen. Ich will das letzte Bit rausquetschen und nie eine Cashline missen. Ich hacke mit meinem virtuellen Beil vorbei an deiner Firewall, die vom Misskonfiguration schon überquoll und find ein interessantes Pfeil. ETC, pass WD. Ich versuch John minus minus wordless gleich rock you, dessen Ergebnis, obwohl du ein Nerd bist, war ein Schock, du. Are you fucking kidding me? 1Q, 2W, 3E, oh nee, das Maß an Dummheit, das tut weh. Ähm, ich liebe die Kernels und Turnels, ich bin ein Gaffer der Buffer, meine Augen machen bling bling, wenn sie regelrecht aufsaugen, den Fehler im Format String. Ich warte. Ich warte auf einen Bug im Treiber deiner Netzwerkkarte. Ich warte auf einen Pack neue, auf einen Pack Kugelschreiber und dazu eine Mate. Ich warte auf den Durchbruch in der Security-Sparte und auf den Überlauf nach oben drauf. So, this was just the introduction to the next talk. Um, It's also held in German because I've prepared the slides already in German for another talk. Um, but there is an English write-up on a on a blog you will see. Also, worum geht es? Um, es geht um Router Hacking, um, aber ohne physikalischen Access. Uh, we'll fix it, continue yep. talking. Um, aber jetzt ohne physikalischen Access und nicht nur ein Router, sondern es geht um das um, Hacken der ganzen Fritzbox Serge. Ihr erinnert euch vielleicht? Ja. Ähm, 
Anfang Februar diesen Jahres gab es äh, so eine Geschichte, ähm, irgendwie 4.200 Euro Schaden durch das äh, Anrufen von Premium-Anrufen von Angreifern und die erste Meldung von AVM, dem Hersteller der Fritzbox war, ähm, irgendwie die haben Kundendaten abgefischt und haben sich dann bei aktiviertem Fernzugriff, im, also bei Fernzugriff, der erreichbar ist, aus dem Internet eingeloggt und haben dann irgendwelche Premium-Rufnummern ange... Äh, also es ist einfach langweilig, ja. Ähm, es wird langsam besser. Ähm, der, das nächste Statement war, dass die Angreifer offenbar einen Weg gefunden haben, die Authentifizierung beim Fernzugriff zu umgehen. Ähm, und man soll den Fernzugang einfach abgeschaltet lassen und man ist safe. Okay. Heiße Security hat es wohl ein bisschen genäher analysiert und hat gesagt, nee, es, es liegt doch nicht am Fernzugang. Ähm, es kann im Prinzip jede einfache Website ausnutzen. Immer noch keine Details und ich habe mir gedacht, irgendwie ist es doch interessant, wenn nicht mal AVM einen Plan hat, wo überhaupt die Lücke ist. Ähm, sie hat enormes Potenzial, über 50% Prozent der Router, der Customer-Router in ähm, Deutschland sind Fritzboxen und es ist ein Embedded Device mit MIPS-Architektur, also auch interessant. Ähm, der Patch war schon draußen, war AVM auch relativ schnell, hat irgendwie zwei Wochen gedauert oder so, je nach Gerät. Ähm, ich habe mir dann eine ungepatchte und eine gepatchte Firmware-Version geholt für das gleiche Gerät, um die Unterschiede halt gering zu halten. Die aktuelle Firmware gibt es ähm, auf dem FTP-Server, aber die, ähm, aktuell, die verbundbaren Versionen sind natürlich gelöscht, ist nachvollziehbar. Aus irgendeinem Grund, es gibt eine super Community um Fritzboxen, aber kein Mirror der ganzen, ähm, der ganzen Firmware-Versionen. Ähm, ich habe mir dann von einem Studenten, danke, die ältere Firmware-Version zuschicken lassen. Die hat er noch irgendwo rumliegen gehabt und habe dann auch später noch so einen polnischen Mirror gefunden. Ähm, entpacken ist nicht immer so ganz einfach. Ähm, das, die Sache ist meistens irgendwie ein Squash-FS-Filesystem, ist compressed, oft mit irgendwelchen anderen Magic-Values als Header, damit es noch schwieriger wird und so weiter. Aber es gibt Freeds. Ähm, auch so ein Tool, um seine, sein Fritz OS zu, zu hacken, ähm, zu erweitern und weil es eben in Deutschland ähm, illegal ist, einfach die Binaries oder die Firmware-Versionen so wie sie sind zu verteilen, muss auch jeder seine eigene ähm, seine, seine, seine Firmware-Version selbst äh, bauen. Das heißt, es gibt eine tolle Toolchain. Also ich habe das Ding gedifft. Ähm, 89 Binaries sind unterschiedlich, aber keine neuen Dateien und so weiter. Ähm, das Webinterface ist in Lua geschrieben, hat sich auch nicht verändert. Ich habe dann eben Binary Diff gemacht, einfach für jedes File äh, einen, einen Patch äh, berechnet, von dem einen Fall ins andere und äh, die Größe angeguckt. Und dann gab es eben hier zwei Kandidaten, Lua, CGI und WebCM. Dann müssen wir natürlich die Binaries selbst diffen. Äh, IDA Pro natürlich, <lacht> MIPS-Support. Es gibt so ein paar ähm, Plugins, um das zu erledigen. Ich habe dann ein Open Source verwendet, Patch 2. Und ähm, habe dann die erste Lücke gefunden in Lua CGI. Ist auch ziemlich interessant. Ähm, es wird eine Assembly-Instruktion direkt nach Lua exportiert, aber das Ganze ist post auf. Ähm, man braucht eine gültige Session-ID im Post-Parameter. Haben wir nicht. Ähm, deswegen habe ich halt weitergeguckt, äh, die nächste Funk die, die, das nächste Binary angeguckt und da sieht man schon, es gibt eine gematchte, aber geänderte Funktion und äh, System wird nicht mehr importiert, aber dafür eben AVM, IPC, Destroy, Create, Message Send. Ähm, AVM ist der Hersteller von der Fritzbox, IPC, Interprozesskommunikation, klingt schon mal ganz gut. Ähm, habe mir jetzt angeguckt, dann gibt es unten links eben so einen veränderten äh, Block und unten rechts. Unten rechts ist nur so ein so ein Test, ob äh, die, ob, ob, ob irgendein Argument, man weiß natürlich nicht was jetzt erstmal, ähm, kleiner als, also kürzer als vier Zeichen ist und nur im ASCII-Bereich ist, nicht so spannend, kann man machen, aber hier wird es spannend, ähm, es wird mit SNPrintF wird ein String erzeugt, Message Send, CTL, MGR, Template Changed mit einem Argument, einer Sprache. Und damit wird dann System aufgerufen. Okay. Und das haben sie geändert und haben jetzt äh, korrekte Interprozesskommunikation implementiert. Ähm, jetzt ist aber natürlich die Frage, wie komme ich an diese Stelle im Code? Ähm, es, es gibt das Problem, dass in dieser Funktion, die sich geändert hat, eine grundlegende Entscheidung direkt am Anfang des, äh, des Entscheidungs, also direkt am Anfang der Funktion gibt es einen Entscheidungsprozess und ähm, die Bedingung ist eben zur Laufzeit generiert in einem Speicherbereich, der eben zur Laufzeit beschrieben wird. ist nicht so einfach, statisch zu lösen. Okay? Ähm, dynamisch lösen natürlich. Ähm, ich habe mir die Firma ja komplett extrahiert. Ähm, wenn man ähm, dann eben Change-Root auf das äh, Firma-File-System slash macht, dann äh, kann man 
das Binary starten, man muss QEMU natürlich dann statisch kompilieren, weil natürlich QEMU wieder dann sonst auf die Libraries im Crew zugreifen will, das sind nicht die korrekten und so weiter. Und QEMU hat eine GDB-Stub-Option, das heißt, ich kann mich äh, mit dem ID8 äh, Pro GDB Remote Debugger dann direkt, ähm, kann dann direkt das MIPS-Binary, das ich emuliere, und dass die Libraries in dem Change Root verwendet ähm, dynamisch analysieren. Das ist ganz nett. Es gibt eben so ein paar Optionen, äh, so ein paar Probleme, richtige Permissions und sowas. Dann gab es äh, für die Firmware, die, also die, die Firmware, die ich hatte, ähm, war für eine Fritzbox, die einen Prozessor ähm, hat mit einem Chipset, den äh, QEMU nicht unterstützt. Es war nicht ganz so einfach, dann habe ich einfach eine gepatchte Firmware für eine Fritzbox mit unterstützten Chipsatz verwendet und die Checks, die ich inzwischen kenne, on the fly umgangen. Ähm, und wenn man das eben dann noch so ein bisschen weiter reversed, ähm, sieht man, dass es gibt ein großes Switch-Case-Statement und so und ein Parameter, es ist ein CGI-Binary ähm, hier, ist eben varlang. Äh, man findet dann raus, dass das Ganze eben äh, mit einem Texas Instrument Interpreter eingelesen wird von den Environment Variables, die werden natürlich davor wieder gesetzt und so weiter. Letzten Endes ist es aber einfach der Get-Parameter zu diesem Binary, varlang. Und wenn man, ähm, wenn dieser Parameter gesetzt ist, dann wird so ein globales Flag gesetzt, äh, varlang set, und dann äh, passiert natürlich das, dass man einfach die, die, den anderen Control Flow benutzt, also nach rechts zu unserem, ähm, zu, zu unserem System Call gehen und wir, äh, also Command Injection ist jetzt kein Rocket Science oder so, man hängt einfach ein äh, Semikolon an und dann kann man da beliebigen Code aus und äh, so, äh, ja, wenn ihr mehr lesen wollt, ähm, hier ist ein Metasploit-Modul, um das Ganze auszunutzen. Äh, in der CT gibt es einen deutschen Artikel, auf meinem, äh, auf meinem Blog Breaking.Systems gibt es einen englischen, ziemlich langen Artikel und das ist mein Name. <lacht> Sorry. Vielen, vielen Dank. Dankeschön, thank you. Next up is schwil.ch. Uh, hi everybody, um, we invite you to join uh, shul.ch. Uh, first thing, uh, please help us find a better name, uh, this is just a working title. Uh, we're working on a platform to organize courses, uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, we both are active in autonomous schools and we spend a lot of time coordinating between people. Uh, people who would like to learn, people who know stuff, people who have spaces, people who have equipment. And we have these uh, nagging voices in our heads always. For example, can you ask the woman who does the Portuguese course whether beginners are welcome? Or, or, or I'd like to learn welding. Is anybody interested in gardening? I have seeds. Oh, and a friend knows uh, some abandoned agricultural land. We, we, maybe he could ask if he could use it. Who would like the new text of the Invisible Committee and discuss it? Uh, or well, when will the German lessons on Monday start? Where could we do this bicycle repair afternoon? And, or we have this offset printer. Come, come and help operate it. So uh, this is... All the time we're dealing with, with this stuff and uh, people come to us and ask, oh, when is this, when is that? And uh, we'd like to have a tool that lets the people do this themselves. So, uh, when, because this takes a lot of time and it doesn't work. Uh, takes a lot of, of effort. Uh, we've been looking at software projects um, who, that do this, for example, and you, you find stuff, there's the public school, but they use it only for themselves, for their own projects, or you have Meetup, for example, which is very casual and doesn't really fit our needs. Yeah. So, um, the motivation to start programming came as well from uh, seeing other projects, hackerspaces, political activists, other autonomous schools, social centers who might use the program as well. Uh, 
Um, and the, yeah, the best, in best case, they use a wiki for this purpose, like here. And so how does it work, the concept? Everybody can propose a course and describe what is needed. And then everybody can browse through the list of courses in their region and uh, they can subscribe as a participant or as a host, that meaning they have a space where this course could be done. We, we always look for real spaces in meet space. Uh, and uh, they can sign up also as mentor, for example, if they know how to do this. Then content can be discussed. And once a date is fixed, it appears in the calendar. It's quite easy. After this, uh, the courses are held in real life, as we say. Uh, we really intend this to be a tool for people to meet because uh, just sharing knowledge through, uh, I don't know, uh, wikis is something that already works if you know how stuff works, if you want to look up stuff, but um, to communicate knowledge, you need to meet physically, and that's what we're trying to do. So we have the thing without a name yet, it's free software, we're uncommercial, should be as most possible community driven. We are asking, uh, we're trying to get funds from foundations. And we think besides uh, regional installations, which are continuous, it can be used in, for example, democratic schools within institutions or for uh, temporary installations as this event here. So uh, we're writing this prototype. Uh um, on how we imagine this to work. Um, we call it hmm. Uh, it covers the essential functions. Uh, you can reach it at test.schul.ch. Please be gentle with it. Uh, it's work in progress. Uh, it's also public, so uh, yeah, behave. Uh, um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, um, we, we try, we'll try to use this uh, in public spaces. Um, yeah, come talk to us. Uh, we're developing it. We need help. And we have a self-organized session. I think we go together with part uh, at three in the hall 13. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Meshlink. Hi, my name is Chris Liepen, and I will introduce Meshlink to you. It's a library which provides secure mesh communication for maybe your application. So why would you want to have mesh communication? Well, in a mesh, you have many nodes. And think of you have many instances of your application running. And maybe you have some friends which are using it. Or maybe you have, you're just you yourself, you're running an application on multiple devices. And you want to have them communicate with each other because that way you can, for example, have text or voice chat, uh, file transfer, uh, maybe it's a game and you want to have multiplayer gaming. Uh, you want to maybe synchronize time or some settings. Or maybe something else that uh, you have thought of. So what is MeshLink? It's a C library. At the moment, it also has C++ bindings, and maybe in the future, Python or your favorite language. Uh, it's cross-platform, runs on many operating systems. It supports IPv4 and IPv6 networks. Um, and it takes care of all the mesh communication details for you. So it will take care of uh, punching holes through your uh, masquerading firewalls, uh, finding out where all the other nodes are and how to uh, best communicate with them. Uh, and last but not least, it runs in its own thread, so you don't have to worry about uh, how to integrate this library into your event loop, or you're not forced to use the event loop that the library uses. So what are the mesh features that you have? Well, uh, first of all, it's a fully decentralized mesh, so there are no central nodes, it does not call home, uh, and it provides end-to-end -end encryption to all the nodes in the network. Uh, and it's using ED25519 uh, elliptic curve key, uh, keys for this, and the ChaCha Poly1305 uh, cipher. Um, and it also makes it easy to invite uh, new nodes into your mesh. 
and we'll show that later. Um, and how do you communicate with nodes? Well, there are functions uh, that give you UDP and TCP style communication. So here's an example uh, of how to use uh, MeshLink in your application. Uh, you can just uh, call the function MeshLink open, which gives you a handle, and it takes care of um, creating your own key if it's not already created. Um, and then you can register some callbacks. Most likely you want to register a callback uh, that is called whenever some other node sends data to you. And then you can start the mesh. It will be finding out where the older nodes are and doing everything it needs to do. And then you can just say, okay, um, I want to handle to a specific node, and I can just use the meshing send command to send uh, a packet of data to it. And when you're done, of course, you can close it. Um, but now, here is how to invite new nodes into your mesh. You have a simple function, mesh link invite, um, and the result is a string that looks like a URL. Um, and this URL is uh, reasonably short, so it's less than 80 characters, uh, and it contains enough information for another node to find your node uh, and to uh, securely um, exchange public keys with each other. And then, well, they can link together. Uh, you can send the URL via instant messaging, maybe you can do near field communication, you can display it on a screen as a QR code. Uh, and then, well, of course, this is uh, the one who invites someone else. The invitee uh, gets this URL, and then in the application, you just call meshlink join with this URL, and it will do all the key exchange uh, behind the scenes, and it will just give you a simple Boolean result, did it work or did it not. Um, uh, at the moment, the library is still uh, a bit uh, beta quality, but there's a uh, running code with examples at http uh, slash slash git.meshlink.io. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can email me at goose at meshlink.io. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next up is a PhD in hacking. Hi. Um, because I'm probably the last talk or uh, one of the last talks, uh, I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of my time to ask you for a big applause for all the angels and the moderators uh, who are doing really good work uh, here. So. I'm going to talk about uh, a real and proper uh, PhD or undergrad uh, in hacking. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a security evangelist uh, at Red Sox who make a really cool appliance uh, that detects malware and esp espionage without uh, infringing on anyone's uh, privacy. But I'm also uh, a professor in hacking, means I just teach hacking, at a Plurno. And a Plurno is uh, the institute uh, where you can get this PhD. Well, first off, what is it? It's a fully accredited university degree, um, and it means we've, uh, with Oplerno, we went through all the hoops, uh, through all the regulations uh, to get it uh, as a proper accredit accredited uh, degree title. We're doing a, match a bachelor, master's, uh, and a PhD, and it's also broad spectrum. With that, I mean, it's not just computer hacking, it's also uh, social engineering, it's biological, it's just about anything you can uh, find. Uh, you'll get uh, taught fundamental sciences like uh, mathematics, uh, physics, biology, but also you get complementary classes like uh, arts for observation, um, ethics, uh, and also um, perhaps if you want to, things like fashion. Well, why do we want this? Um, there's a lot of uh, specialization in IT and people start uh, focusing on just their small part of it. Uh, this means there's a lot of vulnerabilities that come from uh, outside uh, factors. Let me just um, uh, explain this a bit. Uh, the people from uh, SCADA, uh, Strangelove, they can show you a bit more that uh, a lot of vulnerabilities come also from uh, people getting pressures outside, not because they're stupid programmers, but just because they have coding styles or because they have been pressured to use Library X, uh, which has uh, vulnerabilities, things like that. Um, and I don't believe there's a simple thing like 
thinking like a hacker. You can't uh, learn to think like a hacker in six weeks or just get a certificate uh, in that. For that, uh, you'd really need to have uh, a really broader uh, view of the world. Um, how you can do this? You just go to uh, www.oplearner.com and enroll. But for the PhD, I have to disappoint you, we're still working on the curriculum because doing a full PhD curriculum is really hard work uh, and it's a lot of work. Uh, we just uh, got the approval uh, for doing this and doing a, uh, it as a real university program uh, this year. So you can't just enroll uh, and, and expect to start next year. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we also need uh, people from uh, all over, from all uh, different um, specialities and, and uh, groups uh, to come sit on the board to talk with us uh, what you want to see in a, in a curriculum for, for hacking. And also I need uh, more professors, uh, more teachers, people not just uh, in hacking uh, systems, but also in, uh, for instance, hacking psychology, uh, biology, uh, anything actually. And that's it. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. So does anyone have questions? All right, I see a raised hand. A microphone to the... Sorry? Is it possible to do impromptu talk since the wiki was down? <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I, I don't think we have the time. All right, any more questions for um, the gentleman to my left? Where are you based? Um, that's a bit of a hard question because it's completely online. That's why we had uh, this really difficult time in, in going through all the hoops as getting a, uh, to be a fully accredited university. But uh, if you want to, you can talk to us offline. Uh, the CTO of Oplano is also here, so you can ask him any question you like. All right, there's a question from the internet. Please, to the gentleman. So the question was, where does it take place? So I guess it was just answered. You can go now to the uh, site already, but uh, as I said earlier, uh, we still are building the complete PhD curriculum, and that, that's a lot of work. We don't want to rush it or just make money out of it or anything stupid like that. So you can just contact us and, and uh, be in touch with us, and then you'll know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. The next talk is called Unity with a Y. Yeah, so hello, my name is Matthias, and I'm here to present a project um, of a few friends of mine. So Unity, it's about sharing culture, and it should be a tool to support sharing culture. There's a trend going on that lots of people are willing to share what they do, to, to change their lives a bit, to get out of um, the world most people live today. So you may have heard of projects like space sharing, uh, where people offer their space for other people to use it, maybe for urban gardening or stuff like that. There are lots of Facebook groups where you can offer stuff you don't need and other people can just go to you, get it from you, bring it back later or give it to other people. Then there are the bigger communities like couch surfing, where you can offer free um, accommodation for somebody. Um, there's Mundraub, which maps places where you can just go to pick up some food that is uh, left there. So maybe acres with, um, uh, yeah, just some food. Then, well, most of those um, projects have a common problem, which is organization because a lot of those people are not from the technical side. They just have this idea to make the project. And well, they depend on, on, a, lot, um, on a great community to work, but they have to reach this community. So there's the idea of unity, which should be a tool to simplify sharing and finding offers. So we have the idea to create a project uh, that can be used by multiple projects with specific needs that everyone can search for the project he's interested in on a, on a single platform. So this should be a common base 
Um, you can imagine it a little bit like a social network, but um, we don't want to create another Facebook. It should just be a basis so you can do things like communication, maybe have a map to find projects near you. And while well, there's always the problem that you have uh, to trust in each other, so this maybe is an, an unsolved problem right now. Uh, Unity should support specialized modules so the specific needs of any project uh, can be implemented there easily. This is a very uh, small overview about this. So, well, we just want to create something where other projects can plug in. Um, this can maybe be a decentralized structure later, but there's just this idea right now. Um, Unity already has some ideals. It should be a completely money-free project. So. Um, it should be created and developed by the people who use it, who are willing to give their time to this project to support other projects. And we also want to be democratic and open source. So I think this should be quite clear. It should be free for everyone to use and to develop further to use for their projects. Um, small words about the people behind this. The, the main idea uh, comes from Raphael Felmer. Um, Maybe some of you know him. He is uh, yeah, in, present in the media because he lives in Money Free since 2010. Um, he was also the initiator of Lebensmittelrenten.de, a platform which uh, steps in against food waste. So um, it organizes people that are willing to go to supermarkets and, so, um, uh, and take the food that they can't sell anymore and share it with other people. Um, now it's uh, all based in food sharing, which is the project where these people behind Unity are currently uh, spending a lot of time in. Um, yeah, we have, through these people, a lot of contact to existing sharing projects and uh, bring a lot of experience from food sharing, um, where we already have about 60,000 users with hundreds more coming every day, willing to do anything about the resource waste. So in this specific kind, the food waste. Yeah, um, we still need more ideas and critics for this project because we are in a very early stage. There's no code yet, there's just this idea. Um, we are always looking for developers willing to implement it, and also we need projects which use it later. You can contact us uh, on the website um, or on email, and well, if you have any specific questions, I'm here in the Congress, you can maybe meet me later, drop me a mail, and we can meet here. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Lava Arrows. Um, okay. Please look down there. Oh, okay. Um, and speak into the microphone, please. Yes. Um, Lava Arrows, it's uh, a project from a friend of mine and me. It's Andy, it's, uh, the dude who's not here today, and I. And I'm more the electrical engineer, and he's more the uh, Haskell hacker. And we made we noticed some problems with VHDL. The problem is that in VHDL you have just this low-level declarative way of describing electro, uh, electro, electric circuits. Um, when you try to describe a chip, you just uh, wire together your gates in some very basic fashion, and you don't have this automatic semantic check and so on and um, Andy and uh, well Andy noticed that you have basically the capability in VH in Haskell to do some basic check uh, extended checking uh, without an additional test bench because you have it in the nature of Haskell because you can um, for formalize it and then auto-check it as some additional feature in already included in the language because uh, when you have a very simple circuit like, uh, like uh, two blocks C and D, 
Um, it's like a, S is a, is a wire, it goes into a block C. You have a wire which comes out, that's T. You have a wire, uh, you have a block D, that's another circuit, and you have U. Then you can transform it like that, and you have your type, well, we already implemented that, S, which is a wire which uh, has all, which doesn't have the same problems like these bosses in VHDL where you can wire it the wrong way around or have the wrong offset of the, of the area, uh, for example, pin three to eight instead of two to seven or something. And you can uh, merge it together and can all do, you can do all this stuff, uh, this mathematical stuff, and you can uh, have this very simple expression, uh, uh, which actually is, uh, as I mentioned, is the Haskell hacker, so <laughs> that's a, ha a Haskell ex expression for this circuitry I showed. And um, then you can easily check it. Uh, that's, uh, for example, how we uh, auto-check our circuit in our example. Um, uh, uh, example project where, we proven, where we've proven that it's already working and that we have a basic implementation of arrows. And Look to the front screen, please. Okay, sorry. <laughs> And do I? Okay, so like that. And um, what we want to do in the future is having a state machine generator as well in our has in our Lava Arrows project, which would additionally give us the opportunity to uh, have some uh, imp procedural uh, expressions turned into a state machine directly. And direct synthesis for uh, Vertex 6 because right now we are doing some um, rudimentary VHDL generation out of uh, uh, arrows because the synthesis doesn't work right yet. Uh, and I heard something, someone last thing. Because? Okay, uh, thank you for attention. Uh, and by the way, if you want to contact uh, and or ask me because it was a little bit disturbing and unorganized, this presentation, um, you could uh, just add, uh, contact me there. Uh, on the O2S uh, page, there is a contact where you can ask what we are doing exactly because I just had to condense uh, the 30-page paper into five minutes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So next up is Panda Lang. Okay, this is a live demo, which I can't do on this computer. So you have to do it yourself. And uh, you hang on, speak into the microphone, please. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Where are we? There is something missing. Okay. So this is a live demo, but I can't do it on that computer apparently. But if you have a Chrome browser, you just go to pandalang.org and you can type in the expressions and try it out as we go along. So, uh, I'm talking about a uh, language I'm building as of uh, two years, and this language is uh, streamed, is data flow, event driven in the tradition of Erlang and other things, but it is, uh, runs in the Node.js and it runs inside the browser, and actually the parser compiler and everything is uh, written in JavaScript or the language itself. So you can just fire it up, pandalang.org, and uh, there's no install or anything, which is one of the reasons I'm uh, doing it. Uh, the language is special in the way that it has no loops and no if statement, and I'm gonna show that we don't need this. It's functional, and uh, it has a no function. I'm not gonna go into that, but it has no ifs and no loops. So here is simple expressions. We have free, we have a hello world, we have uh, uh, a URL, and it knows the URL is a URL. I, 
think with a lot of languages, you type URL to the computer in programming and it doesn't know what it is, and you have to import a library and you have to do a lot of stuff. I think languages should know what you're doing. There's various ways of typing expressions. Since it's functional, you can use a lot of parentheses. I don't have a Lisp syntax, but I have a simpler syntax. Uh, you don't need the, the commas, uh, but actually I prefer the way of doing kind of jQuery style, as some people call it, where you do object-oriented dispatch of methods. So three plus four times two. And the main idea of a language is that you don't write the program in blind, because that's how we program mostly, and we never test our programs. But you rather start with an expression. You start with a value, and you're going to do something with it, and then you get your result. By doing this, you do an exploration of the data program, as well as how to actually test it. You're testing it while you go along. And it's very easy if there's a little syntax. Uh, the syntax could be used with a bar, so it's like a pipe operator, because actually it's concurrent, and each expression you type in the browser will actually run concurrently uh, and will not block. Um, so uh, things I can do, I can uh, type a URL, I can say HTML, because all the functions are named after what they will give you, and uh, then you can say iframe, so we'll put my website in an iframe. Uh, you can also say you get the HTML, and then you can kind of get into it, uh, get all the A-links, and it will show you all the links. And uh, it's quite easy. Um, here is a stream operator where you say, give me the values 1 to 10. It is not an array. It's a singular value is being passed through in a data flow manner. So all the functions are not working on arrays. They're working on singular values. So how do we loop? Well, we don't. We take the values 1 to 10. We say we want the even values. The, e, the function even is a filter. It's a predicate, and it returns the value if it passes the predicate. So we see it will return 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Now, for a more complicated expression, like 1 to 10, we square those values, and we uh, keep the values less than 15. It's that easy. Uh, most people who are going to write the equivalent program in your favorite language, except ML maybe, uh, take about two and a half minutes. Some guy said, oh, I can do it in JavaScript in 30 seconds. It took him two and a half minutes. And he hadn't even written the loop because there was too much syntax. So he actually wrote the array initialization by hand, 1, 2, 3, because that is faster. Um, now, I'm playing with the syntax. The dot is easy, it's jQuery style, but it looked dense. And you have to write all the parentheses. And the pipe operator is the, uh, the other way of doing it. So that is one way. Um, here are some simple examples. You can take the values 1 to 3. You can wrap them in a list item, because this runs in the browser. It actually will be happening. You can um, take a text. You can wrap it in a div. And then you can say, take that DOM element named foo and get a click from it. And when you get a click, print the time. So each time you click on click me, it's actually going to uh, send a message uh, to the time and show the time for each click. So it's very easy to connect things because it's all event driven. And there's no synchronization to care about and things like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last talk for today is about ArcOS. Hi. OK. Um, Many of you are open source programmers, I think. Um, and like, I've been looking up to you guys for, for really a number of years, and I want to be as cool as you are. Um, I looked for a lot of uh, projects, but nothing really felt right until um, ArcOS came up. So um, what is ArcOS? So since a couple of months, I'm programming for it, and why did ArcOS catch me and the others did not? Also, for a long time, I wanted to have my own server, and it should be at home, and it should be cheap. Now, until this level, it's, it's easy to reach, uh, and you know how to do that, but it should also be simple. I actually did not long, want to learn how to set up a mail server, and I don't know about who, so who of you has been setting up a mail server? Okay, that's... OK, that's a lot of people. I, I didn't want to learn to, but I heard it's hard. Is it hard? Meh, <laughs> OK. <laughs> so um, yeah, 
And more than mail servers, it should also be, yeah, give me lots of stuff that is on the internet, right? If I want to upload a video, I do not want to use YouTube. I want to have it on my own server, but it should be as convenient as YouTube. And there's more, Skype, for example. I want to use something like Skype, but it, that, that is hosted on my server. Um, and so that was pretty much what ArcOS um, seems, you know, or gives me already. Um, how does Arc command in implement or do it? So it's based on Arc Linux. Um, cheap, of course, because you, you uh, installed it on the Raspberry Pi or nowadays on more powerful single board computers. And it should be as simple as flash the SD or obtain it from somewhere, connect everything to the router, and then open your browser. And well, after, after doing that, you should get something that looks like this. So this is what it looks like. Um, on the panel, these are, these are apps that you can click. So these are, these are either web apps or server-based server apps. And I did Etherpad, Mumble, and Docker Wiki of them, and you cannot imagine how proud I am of that. So that's cool. Um, and also the, so it should also, also the, the rest of the operating system should be accessible through the web interface. So there's, there's some um, stuff for that. And now if you click for on, on Mumble, uh, for example, this is, this is the panel that you get. So you can add some, so, so, so um, change some parameters and stuff, and with the status button, you can, you can actually turn it on. And it's, yeah, I think it's really simple. This is how simple it is to install a web app. Um, you give it a name, you, give, you enter the domain, and the port number, and, and this is it. Of course, you have to do some port forwarding, uh, but in the future, there will also be some services to, to make that easier. Um, yeah, that's almost it. Um, for the future, we're, we're working on implementing Jitsi, which is a, um, so which is a, a web-based, um, um, sorry. Uh, so it's video conferencing via WebRTC. Um, also, a Diaspora plugin should come and Media Goblin. And um, yeah, if you like what you have seen, if you want to try it, you can start at um, arcos.io. And uh, yeah, please give it a shot. Please try it. That's it. I have stickers. <laughs>uh, thanks for uh, for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you said you haven't set up a mail server yet. Um, how do you make an OS that does it for you? <laughs> uh, oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I joined ArcOS, and and the uh, so there's there's many people who do it. It's it's not it's. So most of the effort is done by, by other people, and there, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't tell you. Uh, the most important thing being that there was a Kickstarter one year ago um, for one developer who is working on that project for one year, and he did basically all of it, and there's a couple of minor things that other developers do, for example, me. So yeah, the, the mail server was set up by somebody who knows to how, how to set up the mail server plugin. <laughs> Thanks for the question, yeah. All right, final question at microphone two. I don't know if we can actually activate this microphone. If not, can we have? I, oh, 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 right. Uh, so I looked at the website, and I didn't find a way how to port it to another device. And I have another device, which I might want to port it to. So how to do that? Um, which device? So uh, it's one of these uh, Western Digital, MyCloud, NAS okay. things. Um, so it has so there's, a, there's a couple of microboards, like also the QB truck and, and others that we support right now. And of course, we, we want to port to as many platforms as possible. But uh, for this, we need help. So if you want to join and uh, try to port Arcos to that OS, 
that would be really cool to make it available to more people. And <laughs> sure, maybe we can have a look at it. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for listening to our awesome speakers. <laughs> These speakers.